mentioned you had your first CIO position at Inatai Foundation. You had a very interesting problem set of somebody gave you essentially $2 billion and you had to create a strategy. <laughs> Tell me about that process. So the way we think about the world is if you plot kind of you know time and revenue for a company, it ends up looking like an S-curve. And we think in the first part of that S-curve where revenue goes from zero to something or remains mostly zero where you're funding losses, that's venture. And then when revenue is kind of scaling up, that's growth. When revenue is maturing at some point, it's buyout or public markets. And when it's tipping on the other side, it's either distressed or short equity. When we go back to that construct of kind of where we want to concentrate and the notion of concentrating in places where there's efficiency and innovation, it clearly leads you to technology and it clearly leads you to, to venture capital. So it's very much a core focus for us. Again, I said we're 10% now. We think we'll get to 20%, you know, slowly over time. For more ideas on how to raise venture capital in this market, make sure to subscribe below. Mutu, you have one of the most unique backgrounds for chief investment officers. I've been really excited to chat. Welcome to 10X Capital Podcast. Thank you, David. Thanks for having me. Tell me how you came to be the chief investment officer of Children's Healthcare of Atlanta. Yeah, I think, I think you're right. Very, very differentiated or unique background, I guess, in that you know my undergrad is in hospitality management, which is not the foundation most people build an investment career off of. So I did that for undergrad and then worked in the hotel business and you know thought to myself that I worked in the business for two years and realized it wasn't something I was interested in. So you know I, I quit and took some time off and really considered what I wanted to do in life. And I still wasn't quite sure, so I went and got an MBA. I was really, really lucky because between my first and second year of B school, I got an intern with the state of Florida's pension fund down in Tallahassee. And that kind of opened my eyes up to this whole world of kind of mission-driven investing. And that started me on the journey. I think, you know, I just wanted to get into the business, started kind of in, in private equity at the state of Florida after I graduated, worked for this wonderful human being called Jim Trainer, learned that, and then got an opportunity to move to the University of Richmond, Spider Management, where I really was able to learn a lot outside of private equity. And that got me interested about, you know, being a CIO and spending more time on asset allocation and things like that. I was just lucky um, that I kept, you know, getting into the path of people that were willing to kind of giving me more opportunity and, you know, let me learn. And that finally converted in, in 2019 into a CIO job at the Inatai Foundation, which I, I was, you know, incredibly lucky to get, I think, but it was an incredible experience also and kind of got me on the path of the chief investment role. You've been able to navigate your career very effectively, staying, gaining skill sets, building relationships, and moving on into into roles where, where you had more autonomy. The next generation, people that are leaving business school, how would you advise that they approach their career? One of the favorite books I've read is called Range, and I think it, it talks about kind of generalists and how generalists kind of operate in the world versus, versus specialists. And I think what I took away from that is that a lot of times before you specialize, it's good to be a little bit of a generalist. And I think getting as much exposure as you can to as many different things as you can early on in your career, I, I think is really, really useful. Even if you want to do that, you have to find yourself in places that are that kind of allow you to do that, I think. So, you know, my advice would be to look for opportunities on teams where it it's available to kind of look at one thing and then switch over and look at the other thing or just available to be to be a generalist landing at spider management and working for a guy called rob blanford is where all that came together for me where you know so my advice would be to kind of seek those people out that, that you think will, will give you that opportunity and also seek those teams out that have the structure where you can kind of you know learn more than one thing tell me about the skill sets that you learned by being a generalist i think it's mostly Connecting the dots, David, it's kind of thinking across, I think, the opportunity set is really what I learned. Now, I'll give you an example. Like One thing that stands out to me is kind of the decision, let's say, on, on illiquidity, right? So you think about you know, growth, for example, and you weighed the opportunity of doing kind of public market or, or say private market growth in the U.S. versus you know, public market growth in Asia. I think the comparison you're making is that in developed markets, for the most part, you know, so many sectors are so saturated that you kind of to, to get growth, you need to actively take market share from your competitors, which I think at some point means that you have to actively change consumer behavior. I don't think it's impossible, but it's complicated. And then you weigh that against the opportunity of public investing in Asia, where a lot of the growth doesn't come necessarily from taking market share from competitors and changing consumer behavior, but it just comes from growth of wallet. Having worked in both of those areas helps you make those decisions, I, get, I, I think, on relative value terms. Buyout is another example, at least for me. So, you know, at the end of the day, if you look at small cap U.S. equity markets, it is, I think, a liquidity play or an illiquidity play in that you're investing in, in companies that 
maybe have some efficiency gains to make, and then the, the market recognizes it and pays you with, with liquidity. There's a better way to do that within the buyout world, where you are still kind of in small cap equities, but you own it, you control it, and you can add the value, and then you can seek liquidity in the market. The biggest thing for me on, on the generalist and, and why I think it's been additive to how I think about the world is that you can connect those dots, and you can say, hey, I see this here, I see this here. How do those dots compare? Because I have the opportunity to do both. Absolutely. Where I think is the best thing in each bucket. You've chosen at, at Children's Healthcare to also have a group of generalists. So one thing is the CIO is the generalist, yeah. and the other is the team is the generalist. Tell me about that. Yeah. yeah, so you know we're all generalists, but we all have our biases on the team. So there's folks that kind of grew up in the private world. There's folks that grew up in the public world. So I think you know we all have different biases, but we all kind of you know come together to work on it. And I think you know if I were to describe the process and how it works, I think it's a little bit of kind of organized chaos, right? Like you know things come in and and people tend to look at it, but we we try to process it out by having kind of one you know funnel of ideas that the team can talk about in totality with with each other, so that you know the general model, the generalist model works in that there's always a deal champion. The thrust of it is that we we would like for it to be not you know, one person doing all the work and then presenting it to the rest of the team and they kind of ask, but having a small group of nimble, nimble journalist folks that can all kind of, you know, more than one person can work on one thing type approach. Let me play devil's advocate. If you were to take a journalist yeah. and put them into venture, let's say they're a top decile LP in the private equity space, they would make significant costly mistakes. They would create concentrated portfolios. They would try to look for companies that they yeah. could change or improve. So it would be disastrous. How do you negate the potential risks of having a generalist team investing into different assets that may be idiosyncratic? It is, as I, said, I think each team member has its, has their biases. So if you look at our team today, you know, my biases are kind of venture and private equity. That's where I mostly grew up, I'd, I'd say, rather than, you know, barring the last five years or so, I think that's where I mostly grew up. And then, you know, Zach McGuire on our team has a very deep kind of experience set within, within venture and, and buyout. And then, you know, John Dolphin has spent most of his time, you know, within the hedge fund universe. And then Mike Naguzzi spent a lot of time in the in the public equity universe. So we think we have enough biases there and, and we have enough kind of, I, I guess, internal expertise in each thing where we do have folks, I think, that are more apt to not make those mistakes. I think we're going to make plenty of mistakes, but there's some learnings embedded about, you know, venture and, and buyout and long-term equity, you know, from individual team members that grew up in those asset classes. I think what we try to add on top of that then is, you know, the viewpoint of someone who's not from the asset class. So, you know, John's view on, on venture a lot of times is somewhat differentiated just because, you know, he didn't, he didn't grow up in that, I think at the end of the day, right. But there's other people in the team that did grow up in that, that can hope, hopefully kind of, you know, add balance to it. We're definitely going to make mistakes, David, but I, but I hope it's not kind of fundamental mistakes because we do have people that have fundamentally done the work within each asset class on the team. You had your first CIO position at Inatai Foundation. You had a very interesting problem set of somebody gave you essentially $2 billion and you had to create a strategy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tell me about that process. Yeah, you know, it was it, it was fun. First of all, I think it's always kind of fun to build something from scratch. And I think the biggest and most fun part of it was that there was no legacy that you had to argue against. It was mostly like, hey, does this make rational sense? Let's go ahead and execute it. So it was it was it was a joy to kind of work on. But I think you know, when, when I joined Inatai, we, we thought about kind of what foundation do we want to build and then what do we want to build on top of the foundation and how do we want to get there? So I think the foundation, you know, is pretty much the same for most investment organizations, right? Or at least mission-driven organizations. I think, you know, you need a really strong governance structure that can provide oversight, but that also can move nimbly and, and, and make decisions. I think you need, you know, apt amount of resources to go out there proactively and kind of build relationships and source and, and underwrite managers in all of the markets that you want to be operating in. And you need an amazing team and you need access to good managers. And so we thought about those four things as the fundamentals of what we're going to build. And we started there. And so where that started was with governance saying, hey, this is what we want to do. This is where we want to go talking through governance, understanding how the values and what the organization wanted, how the mission all dovetailed into that. And that actually took a lot of time and a lot of work. And we spent the time doing that. On the resource side, you know, making sure that we communicated the resources that we needed to do what we needed. And then it was hiring the team. So we got some really great hires off, done off the bat, which I was incredibly grateful for. You know, Pong Wong that came in as, as MD, and then Don Wilson, who, who came in as the head of operations. And those were key hires, and then Charlotte Zhang and Julia Riley. 
those are key hires that we all kind of, you know, built the stuff. We had to find out. And I think a lot of the time the access comes from, you know, being able to evangelize the mission, I think, and then, you know, leaning back on networks that you may have had in, in previous places. So that was kind of the fundamentals of what we built. And then on top of that, we said, okay, we need to, you know, put together an investment philosophy, but the investment philosophy has to be apt for the pool of capital. But what kind of pool of capital do we own? A key kind of, you know, things that stood out to us in the pool of capital in a tie is that, you know, perpetual investment horizon and variable spend rate so we could manage it like most endowments do with a very long-term horizon. Um, and the second thing we had to kind of think about is what, what is our constraints or at least what is our, what is our risk framework? And you know, the two things that we were trying to solve for were, you know, making sure that we had enough capital to pay out you know, in, in for the payout and then also compound capital. So we try to think about the balance of kind of, you know, shortfall risk and drawdown draw down risk and what that equity risk might be and decided that 0.7 equity beta was the appropriate risk to take for the portfolio. So we kind of put that philosophy in place saying, look, we're here to allocate that unit of equity beta to where we think the most alpha lives and then back that up with a process that helps you execute proactively look for for markets where we think you know there's there's fertile alpha markets proactively build relationships underwrite etc and then on back of that to drive the process to try to hire the right people and, and create the right cultures i want to unpack a little bit because so, you said a lot yeah. of things that are that are very interesting and, and novel so one is you created the governance first the system second and you hired the people third is that correct We'll continue our interview in a moment after a word from our sponsor. Most businesses use up to 16 tools to hire, manage, and pay their workforce. But there's one platform that's replaced them all. That's Deal, D-E-E-L. Deal is the all-in-one HR and payroll platform built for global work. Smartest startups in my portfolio use Deal to integrate HR, payroll, compliance, and everything else in a single product. Focus on what you do best, scale your business, and let Deal do the rest. Deal allows you to hire, onboard, and pay talent in over 150 countries, from background checks to built-in contracts. You can manage the entire worker lifecycle from a single and easy-to-use interface. Click the link in the show notes below to book a free, no-strings-attached demo with Deal today. You know, it all kind of came together at the same time, I think, honestly. It was one of those situations where I think, you know, we, we, we had the basic framework of what a process would be, and then when people came in, it got better and it got more refined. So I think, you know, it was it was a little bit of both, honestly, David, but but governance is where we really started. When I first got to Inatai, I was at one of our staff retreats, and, you know, somebody said, and I can't remember who it was, it was on the staff meeting, said, you move at the speed of trust, and that really stuck to me. Sure. And so, you know, we we spent the time building trust, I think, with the governance structure. And that trust came from saying, look, here's a hopefully a clearly articulated investment strategy. You know, here are the risk parameters. You know, let, let us really understand the values of the organization and let's bring all that together so that when we build trust around, you know, where we're headed, we can move quickly. So I'd say that that's trust one. with the stakeholders, trust with employees. What was the what was the initial trust that you really I think had to build? Honestly everyone, David. So I think, you know, initially it was the governance structure and, and the leadership at Inatai, et cetera. And then it was honestly trust between ourselves too, right? So we could run quickly and get things done too. So, you know, the the the, the nice part of all of it was that, you know, I and Pong had worked together before and Pong and I had both worked together with Dawn before. So there was already like a very much embedded amount of trust between the three of us. So that enabled us to kind of go off in our own three directions and just get things done. So I think the trust thing was, was everywhere. Um, but if, if you were to think about it sequentially, I think, you know, the only real sequence was kind of getting the governance stuff right first, probably getting the resource stuff right second, because that allowed us to hire people. <laughs> deeper you go into LPs and asset management, you start to learn something really interesting that the most sophisticated LPs care about two things. One is governance and one is asset allocation strategy. There's significant research that shows that how you allocate your assets is much more important than which managers you, yeah. especially in, in asset classes outside of venture, where there's less variability between top, top and, and bottom quartiles. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. And then how, I think, how, how, did, how did you come to that? It was a discussion between kind of Pong and I, and I think, you know, leaning back on a lot of the work that, that Pong had done, I think in, in asset allocation and seeing if it was, it was apt for where we wanted to go. So you're absolutely right. So, you know, we, we kind of honed in on saying, you know, we want to be more dynamic in the asset allocation. We picked very broad benchmarks and very broad target asset allocation. So, which is the same at children's, but we picked a 70% allocation towards equity-like investments and a 
30% allocation to fixed income like investments. And what we thought that gave us was just an equity beta budget. And so, you know, things with equity beta of, you know, 0.5 or less, probably about 0.3-ish, go into that fixed income like portfolio. So that's where, you know, all our hedge funds are housed and all of that. And then everything else with the beta higher goes into the equity like portfolio. So the way we kind of thought about it was like, hey, that is the benchmark. If And then we picked MCI Acquis for the equity like and, and Barclays Act for the, for the fixed income like. And on the MSCI Acquis side, we're like, look, it's, it's clear we can only beat the benchmark if we take risks that aren't in the benchmark. So we try to think about, you know, what, what big buckets of risk are that we need to take. And we kind of said, look, the big buckets of risk we need to take are concentration, illiquidity, leverage, and timing. And we're like, you know, in terms of concentration, we want to concentrate in markets where we think there's a higher probability of generating alpha. And we think those markets are characterized by inefficiency and innovation. And then within illiquidity, you know, we, again, with, with, we want to take illiquidity in places where control is meaningful or influence is meaningful. And that, that is buyout and venture for us. And then leverage and timing is our hedge fund book. So we kind of thought about benchmark, you know, sets the return target, sets the risk parameters, what risk does we want to take that's not in the benchmark? What levers are we going to use to kind of execute those risks? At a very high level, you're optimizing around, seems like two goals. One was funding, you know, the short-term liquidity needs of the foundation that's and right. long-term was the evergreen nature. How do you make yeah. in a tie the, the highest amount of AUM on a risk just a basis 20, 30, 40 years from now? Was there anything else that you were optimizing on? No, I, th I think those were the two goals that we focused on. I think, you know, the 70-30 was a result of saying, you know, if, if you have, you know, more than 70% consistently over time in equity-like investments, then the volatility might be too much and would negatively affect your, you know, drawdown risk. And then on the balance of that, if it was below kind of 60-ish, I think was the number, you weren't taking enough equity risk to, to kind of compound capital and the shortfall risk was high. So we kind of decided on, on that 70 based on that on that math and that analysis, and then kept that as our, our, our North Star. And then, you know, also kind of constrained, I think, over time for, for liquidity need and, and payout and then self-funding of the, of the private portfolio. Do you think there's a systematic risk of principal agent problem in asset management in that there's significantly more downside for people's careers than upside? Clearly, GPs and venture capitalists have quite, quite a lot of upside, so I think they're doing fine. But in terms of LPs, there seems to be systematic conservatism, which may or may not be 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 beneficial to the underlying organization as with any job I, I think there is kind of you know downside and and upside and you know likely the downside is, is a little bit more uh, maybe in these jobs um, than not in terms of the payoff but um, I, I do think you know the upside really is being able to I think you know serve a mission that's powerful that's hopefully personally meaningful to you and, and I think there's an incredible amount of non-quantifiable kind of upside in that in terms of maybe a career and, and then having meaning in life. But I do think probably, you know, economically that the, the tables don't look like they do on the GP side, that it's about all facing the right direction over time, right? The governance structure and the, and the team. And I feel what might be critical in that is to is to have an investment strategy and framework, et cetera, that, that's easy to communicate and that, that everybody around the table understands so that, you know, that moment of capitalization doesn't happen, but also people are willing to kind of see what the longer term outlook is and not make, you know, decisions on, on staffing based on short term outcomes. During your time in, in a tie, before you went to, to run Children's Healthcare of Atlanta, what was your biggest learning at in a tie? You know, honestly, I think it was that the trust equation David, on, on, on how important that is to kind of keep keep momentum going and 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 and, and building and, and and getting things done. So I think coming out of that for me again, one of the biggest learnings was the trust, and then the second biggest learning was was communication. And you know, going into that job, I I thought I was good at like you know trying to keep people abreast of what's going on, but a lot of the times, you know, you know, execution gets in the way sometimes, and you can be you know a little a little you know not so great at, at, at communicating it. So I think another lesson I took away was like, keep that focus on, on communication. Again, I think to underline your earlier point that, you know, make sure that people around the table understand where you're going, what you're doing, you know, consistently. So I think it was that it was kind of like, you know, trust everywhere, you know, among the team members with, with governance structure, with, with, with leadership, you know, again, you know, I, I think it was, was one of the biggest takeaways, you know, a lot of LPs will say, okay, what did you learn from fund one, fund two? Of course you made mistakes. What mistakes did you make and what did you learn from that? 
because oh, yeah. there, there's an there's an assumption that it's okay to make mistakes, of course, but it's what you learn from that and how you become better that that's most no, important. Uh, yeah. I think lessons learned, I think it, it was probably was the communication. I think I got in and was kind of doing things and and maybe not communicating everything I was doing as, as well and the team was doing. So I think the biggest lesson, like, yeah, the biggest lesson learned was, you know, keep, keep your focus on communication and, and you can get sucked into the weeds of execution, but every now and then get get back up and, and, and make sure that every, all the constituents know what you're doing. So then you went to Children's Healthcare of Atlanta. So tell me about the problems set there. What what problems that were you taking over and what were you able to accomplish in the first year? We'll get right back to the interview. But first, to stay updated on all things emerging managers and limited partners, including the very latest data on venture returns and insights on how to raise capital from limited partners, subscribe to our free newsletter at 10xcapitalpodcast.com. That's www.10xcapitalpodcast.com. In terms of the approach or what we've been working on over the last, you know, a little over a year and a half has been kind of the same three pillars that we were working on at Inatai, which is, you know, is, is this is this philosophy apt? Does the asset allocation really reflect or allow the philosophy to work? Does the process kind of support it? And, you know, does, does the team structure in terms of, you know, how we approach the work and who's assigned to what all kind of makes sense. So, you know, that was where initially the work started, David, just to kind of figure out where we were. What catalyzed that analysis was just maybe, you know, a, a shift in the economic backdrop, just generally going from a world that felt like, you know, low interest rates, low inflation, globalization to higher interest rates, higher inflation and deglobalization maybe. So yeah. that was, that's what catalyzed saying, hey, you know, uh, do we still want to do the things that we've been doing over the last 15 years? And that's that's where the analysis started. So philosophically, I think, you know, we were where we needed to be long-term oriented, you know, leaning into our, our competitive advantages in terms of capital and the nature of it. What about within venture? What's your philosophy on that? How many managers are you looking to do? Venture for us is, you know, I, I, is more about, I think, the number might be a little harder for us to control because you know, access and capacity and the size of venture funds. So I think the answer is I'm not quite sure, David, but that is probably where the most number of managers are going to be for us. It will, will probably be kind of the venture bucket, just, you know, given how much we can get to work per fund with relationships. But we have to have some framework for relative value, I think, between between kind of strategy, the asset classes. And we try to at least take more of a first principle approach to, to that and allocating it. So the way we think about the world is – if you plot kind of you know time and revenue for a company, it it, it ends up looking like an S curve. And we think in the first part of that S curve, where you know revenue goes from zero to something or remains mostly zero, where you're funding losses, that's venture. And then when revenue's kind of you know scaling up, that's growth. When revenue's maturing at some point, it's buyout or public markets. And when it's going tipping on the other side, it's either distress or it's short equity. And then we try to think about. What are the value drivers of each one of those strategies? What are the risks embedded in each one of those strategies? What are our expected returns for each one of those strategies? And then in which areas of geographies can we kind of underwrite the risks and, under, and understand the risks uh, better, I guess, to kind of deploy into that strategy. So within venture, we think what drives returns innovation, and we think the risks you're taking clearly are tech risk, market adoption risk, and execution risk. And for that, we want kind of five times gross on a fund level is our expected return. And then in terms of where we think we can go to solve for that, you know, we, we love the U.S. because we think you can solve for innovation and, and technology here. And, you know, we like India because we feel like you, you can find that in India, too. And so we think about which geographies and which sectors that kind of makes sense. And then when you go to the growth spectrum, we think you're driving kind of value through scaling and you're taking market adoption risk and execution risk. And for that, we want kind of three times gross on a fund level. And we think that's available sometimes in public markets in Asia, specifically in India. And then to just kind of for, for sake of completeness on buyouts, you know, we think what fundamentally drives value is, is efficiencies. And we think you're fundamentally taking execution risk. And, you know, we expect kind of, you know, two to three times gross for that on a fund level. And then we think about where do we want to deploy that money. And, you know, we've decided to do that in developed markets because we think there's a depth of operating talent and a depth of transaction talent and a depth of opportunity set in terms of small companies to buy. So tell me about your yeah. venture book today. At Children's. So our venture book today, there's about 10% of the portfolio. And, you know, we have plans to kind of take that to 20% over time. When we go back to that construct of kind of where we want to concentrate and the, you know, I guess 
notion of concentrating in places where there's efficiency and, and innovation that clearly leads you to technology and it clearly leads you to, to venture capital. So it's very much, you know, a, a core focus for us. Again, I said we're 10% now. We think we'll get to 20%, you know, slowly over time. That is not really, I, I think, a target, I'd say. It is a target in that, you know, we'd like to get there, but only if we can find the right partners. So we wouldn't just fill that bucket. But if we think we can invest and partner with the right people, then over time we can we can kind of get to 20. Do you have first-time funds? Tell me about kind of the yeah, vintage diversification. Sort of, yeah, we have both. So we have, you know, fund ones in the portfolio, and we also have you know, funds that have firms that have been around for, for a long time. So we uh, do try to plan that in that we always have a set of, you know, emerging managers in the portfolio. And over time, we think the balance of that is kind of, you know, 60, 70% in kind of mature managers. And then, you know, 15, 20 to 15% in emerging managers and that developing in the middle as we kind of, you know, cross, cross that bridge. So, you know, we, we very, very much focus on kind of looking at emerging managers and then having that balance, I think, of longer dated managers too in the portfolio. What would you like our listeners to know about you, about children's, about anything else that you'd like to shine a light on? Yeah, dude, I think, you know, really our mission at, at the end of the day, you know, I think, you know, here as a team, we take a lot of, of meaning in life just for working basically for the kids of Georgia. And so, you know, if anything, I'd, I'd love to leave um, your audience um, with, with a sense of kind of who we are in our community, what our mission is and, 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 and kind of what we do. And, and, and you know, to, to summarize it, our, our mission at the hospital at, at Children's is to make kids better today and healthier tomorrow. And, you know, I feel like the endowment, you know, serves the purpose of, of the really those two words today and tomorrow, kind of making sure that we're here for spending and making sure that we're compounding capital for, you know, future generation Georgia's kids. When we partner with folks, whether it be venture buyout, you know, they contribute to that mission meaningfully in, in, in a big way. And, and the returns that they generate go directly to helping to helping children. For a long time, Sequoia almost exclusively only had LPs with, with causes that they believed in. So, so I think it, it is truly a huge differentiation in the sp space. And we emailed originally when you were at Emory, so maybe five, six yeah, years ago. So. It's been a while. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's been a while, long time coming. I really appreciate you jumping on, on the podcast and look forward to meeting up in New York or Atlanta very soon. Yeah, absolutely, David. Thanks for having me on. And it was, it was a great conversation. I really enjoyed it.